Well, hello, I'm Josh, and I'm back once again with another film to tell you about. And this week, I have a pretty special one for you. It's hard to believe I've been making these videos for a little over a year now, but here we are. So, to mark my 25th episode, the film I have chosen is Orson Welles' 1958 classic, Touch of Evil. The story takes place in a seedy Mexican border town where narcotics officer Mike Vargas is celebrating his honeymoon. This is soon interrupted when a bomb planted in a car explodes, killing an American building contractor. Over the course of an intense 24 hours, Vargas and his wife have to deal with both the Grandy crime family, who Vargas has a mounting narcotics case against, as well as the town's famous police detective, Hank Quinlan, who has gained a reputation over the years for his intuition. And when Vargas discovers Quinlan has been planting evidence, he decides he must take down the detective and the Grandies. So if you've seen any number of my videos that I've done in this series, you probably picked up that I'm a pretty big fan of Orson Welles. And this is really the film that got me into his work, as well as just classic films in general. I mean, I of course had seen a lot of classic films before this, like To Kill a Mockingbird, It's a Wonderful Life, Psycho, Vertigo, things like that. More of the popular classic movies, but I was still definitely not as interested in classic movies as I am now. And so if I could really pinpoint a moment where that all changed for me, it would be when I watched this film for the first time on Turner Classic Movies back in 2015. They were doing the spotlight on Orson Welles that month, I believe it was May, because it was Orson Welles' 100th birthday. And before that, I had heard of Citizen Kane. I heard it was the greatest film of all time but hadn't seen it yet and so I was watching something else with my parents and this ad on TCM came up that they were showing an Orson Welles movie. It ended up being a double feature of this film and The Lady from Shanghai and so for whatever reason I had decided to go to our smaller TV and watch this film by myself. Again, keep in mind, I did not know anything about this aside from I had heard Orson Welles was a good director. And I was really getting into filmmaking at the time, so I thought I'd check out one of his films. And another thing to kind of keep in mind is I had recently seen this YouTube video where it was kind of an editorial where they were talking about how modern films don't show action as clearly and they cut around a lot of things. And so I knew it wouldn't specifically apply to this film, but I had this idea of longer takes back in the kind of the back of my head. I was just thinking as the film began, I'm going to put this to the test. I know Orson Welles is a famous director, did not know anything he was known for in particular, but I'll just see how long it takes for his shots to play out before he cuts. So imagine my surprise when my introduction to Orson Welles was with one of the most iconic one takes in film history. The shot starting on the bomb being put into the car and then craning over buildings and moving back down to the streets following the cars as people weave in and out in front of it. I was completely caught off guard. And then after the car does blow up, we're shown one of the earliest handheld shots in a feature film. And of course, as the film went on, every shot proved to be masterfully composed and blocked. I had never seen anything like it, and in a lot of ways, I still haven't. And I was even more surprised to find out this film came out in the 50s. It's no wonder Wells was considered to be ahead of his time. And because of this film and how much it caught me off guard, it really caused me to reevaluate how I look at classic films. You know, usually when you think about 60 year old movies, you think slower pace, not super realistic, I guess, whether that being the acting or the dialogue or whatever. And also, generally speaking, there's a lot less camera movement. Everything's a lot more locked off. You know, a lot of times those were the types of films I was seeing. And so before I watched Touch of Evil, I did not realize just how diverse classic movies could get. 
And on top of that, just how much a film could change depending on the director. So what got me seeking out a lot more of these films, I think particularly film noirs for a while. I got into Carol Reed, who, you know, he's another one who was making films in the 40s that did not look like films in the 40s, like The Third Man and Odd Man Out. And, you know, I'm still finding new people that I've never heard about. And I've also grown to appreciate the more classical filmmaking style from the day as well. But I think just really discovering how different and interesting films could be just really got me excited in filmmaking as well as discovering films that I'd never heard of before and seeing who influenced them. So yeah, that's really how this film pretty much influenced most of my uh, film, I guess, journey with the past six or so years. So anyways, to get into this film, the first thing you probably noticed is the main character, Mike Vargas, is played by Charlton Heston in makeup to make himself appear Mexican. Not exactly something that would fly nowadays, nor should it really have back then, but that's kind of how it was back in those days. And as easy as it is to ridicule the idea of Heston playing a Mexican, and believe me, it's pretty easy. And they're always trying to cast their buddies. It doesn't even matter if they're right for the part. Tell me about it. I'm supposed to do a thriller at Universal. But they want Charlton Heston to play a Mexican. But if you look at the history of the film's production and the difficulties Wells had in making the film, it's pretty clear that Heston had a huge role in giving Wells the freedom to make the film that he was able to make here. And throughout production, he was really quite loyal to him. And on top of that, he really does give a good performance in this film. Once you kind of get over the fact that it's not going to be a politically correct one. Thankfully though, the makeup is as far as he goes with this. Apparently in some of the interviews, he brings up that he wanted to do an accent as well. But Orson Welles refused and said the regular accent is enough. An interesting thing though, in the book that this film was based on, Badge of Evil, it's actually the wife who's in this film is played by Janet Lee, who's from Mexico. And Wells actually changed this because he wanted the racism that was more prevalent in the 50s to actually become an element in the story by also having Hank Quinlan, the detective, be kind of a racist, as well as even having Vargas's wife Susan resort to some name calling when she gets cornered by some of Grandy's thugs. This kind of showing some deep-seated racism that even she has. And further throughout the film, Wells has her really confront these fears that she has by setting her against the Grandy family, who, as the film goes on, becomes more and more just kind of stereotypes of not only Mexican gangs, but also just the teenage rebels of the 50s with the leather jackets, the loud roadsters, the rock and roll music and drugs. And Wells does a really good job of making us feel how she's feeling and therefore making everything absolutely terrifying, especially at the hotel. So yeah, there's a lot to dive into regarding race and racism and political correctness with this film. And many others have spoken on this much better than I can, especially within this short video. So I definitely recommend looking up some film journals or articles or looking into the commentaries if you're interested in hearing a little more about this. But moving on, let me give you some background on the production of this film. So as I mentioned earlier, Heston played a pretty big role in getting this film made. And so despite the funny comment that Orson makes in the Tim Burton film Ed Wood, Heston is actually the whole reason Wells was able to write and direct this film in the first place. Originally, Wells was only attached to this film as an actor playing Hank Quinlan. And when Universal offered the job of the lead to Heston, there was no director attached. I said, uh, why don't you have him direct? He's a pretty good director. There was a long pause. And so they offered the job to Wells, who took it without much extra pay, but with the added ability to rewrite the script. Janet Lee came on board, seeing a chance to work with Orson Wells, and after that, they were in production. 
the first day of shooting, Wells had this whole scene planned in an apartment where Quinlan, Vargas, and the rest of the police confront this suspect in the bombing, and they were rehearsing it over and over pretty much all afternoon. Now keep in mind on the sets, at least in those days, the start of a production is largely determined by when a camera starts rolling. So by that point, even though they were late in the day, the cameras had not been turned on yet, so the day hadn't really started. As time kept going by, people were starting to get a bit antsy, as Wells was just choreographing the scene and rehearsing it over and over again. But finally, they were ready to shoot. And the way that Wells had choreographed the scene and blocked it, they were able to do this whole seven, eight minute scene all in one take. And a few takes later, they had wrapped the scene and Wells announced that they were now several days ahead of schedule. And you can see the shot in the film, it's very well done, and it's done in such a subtle way you may not even realize it's all one shot. Wells also admitted that he finds this kind of take much more impressive than the more iconic and show-off-y one take which makes up the opening scene. And throughout the production, everyone seemed pretty happy with the kind of film Wells was making. However, when the film finished production and editing began, this all began to change. There were lots of records and things which kind of break down a little better what exactly happened when Wells started to lose favor with the studio. But essentially, Wells oversaw the early stages of the editing, and after he felt they were well enough along, he ended up leaving the country to try and secure financing for his next film, Don Quixote. This move didn't go over well at all with the studio heads, in the way they saw this as him abandoning the film. And when they saw what the film was all put together, they decided it was way too dark and just the weird mix of comedy and horror was not really what they were looking for and not what they were expecting. And on top of this, they thought the editing that Wells had done made the plot too confusing, and soon began planning reshoots and some added scenes. And for these, Wells was not asked back. Universal pretty much cut him out of the film at this point, and had director Harry Keller film the new scenes. And the quality of these added scenes and retakes are a little mixed. Harry Keller was a pretty solid director who had even made some movies in the film noir genre, but largely is known for his work as an editor, working on films even up into the mid-80s. And for what it's worth, he was given a pretty bad deal with this, having to fill in directing for Orson Welles. And especially after much of the cast, specifically Charlton Heston and Janet Leigh, were refusing to participate and were eventually just kind of forced into it through their contracts. But they all ended up doing it, and from what I gathered, the reshoots ended up being done all in one day. And in fact, Wells was actually quite complimentary about some of the reshoots that Keller did. And regarding one of the added scenes in particular, Wells actually thought they helped convey what he was trying to get across better than he had with his original cut. But that being said, for the most part, it's pretty easy to pick out which of these shots are Keller's and which of them are Orson Welles. I mean, Welles has a pretty unique filming style, and even for him, this was a pretty unusual looking film at the time, with its quick camera movements and the way he shoots actors moving in and out and around the sets. In those days, there was no one doing that kind of stuff, so the thought of trying to mimic this style on multiple setups in one day would really be challenging for any director, probably even Wells. So because of this, these scenes were shot pretty conventionally. They weren't done poorly per se, but as I said, they do stand out. Also, they didn't quite match up Charlton Heston's makeup with what they had when they originally shot these scenes. So in these shots, his skin is much darker than it is in the rest of the film. And it comes off much more blatant that this is just Charlton Heston in makeup. But so anyways, when Orson Welles did end up coming back to the States, he was invited to a preview edit of the film. And after watching what they had done with his film, he went back and typed up a 58-page memo to the studio, where he explains pretty much in chronological order what parts of the film as it is now needed to be changed and how they can do it. 
Now, to be clear, he wasn't exactly trying to turn it back into what he had envisioned originally, but instead he was more trying to make the film that they had just shown him as watchable as possible. And so the thing that is really valuable about this letter is that Wells explains his reasoning behind different choices. It's a very rare thing for a director from this era to go into this much detail on paper explaining things like character motivation, scene structure, and shot length. So the fact that this document even exists and can be easily viewed is pretty incredible. You know, normally these are things he would likely only have been telling the editor, making it so incredibly valuable for filmmakers and scholars that we can read this. And it became very useful for Rick Schmidlin and editor Walter Murch when they did their reconstruction back in 1998. With that project, they used this memo and took the theatrical cut, which was only about 90-95 minutes, and they also took the preview cut, which was discovered in the 70s and was about 20 or so minutes longer. And this is believed to be the cut of the film that Orson Welles would have seen before he wrote his 58-page memo. And so Rick Schmidlin, who was this film preservationist, hired Walter Murch, who if you don't know is probably one of the best film editors ever. He's worked on some of Francis Ford Coppola's best films like Apocalypse Now, The Godfather, The Conversation, as well as George Lucas's THX 1138 and American Graffiti. And he also wrote what's considered one of the most popular books on film editing. So anyways, the two of them would basically go through the memo and go through the films and try to make the fixes to the film that Wells was asking for in his memo. And in doing so, Merch actually discovered that one of the techniques that he thought he had invented for American Graffiti was actually described by Orson Welles 20 years earlier in this memo. And Murch said that in his career he had never encountered another director who paid as much attention to the sound of the film as Orson Welles. And I mean, it kind of makes sense. Orson Welles, of course, made his name on the radio, hosting his own show in his early 20s, and of course with the infamous War of the Worlds broadcast. And in fact, if you listen to that, you can also notice some pretty inventive techniques that he uses to add to the realism. But to get back to Touch of Evil, I think one of the major things that this new edit does is it creates a clearer sense of the story. Most famously though, the reconstruction restores the famous opening shot of the film. For whatever reason, the studio decided to roll the opening credits over the three and a half minute unbroken shot, while also playing Henry Mancini's jazzy theme over the film as well. It's still incredible to look at, it doesn't completely take away its effect. But in Wells' memo, he brings up that he didn't want an additional score to be playing over this scene. And instead, he wanted the music to be coming from the scene, kind of coming out from the different car radios or buildings that we move by. He basically wanted the sound for this to be as realistic as possible. And not to say that the music Mancini wrote isn't great. It'd be great for an opening credit scene, kind of like what Saul Bass would do for Alfred Hitchcock on North by Northwest and Psycho. But this isn't really one of those scenes. I mean, it opens with a ticking time bomb being put in the trunk of a car. The shot is done in one take because it's all about building tension. We know the bomb's in the car, but we don't know when it's going to go off. However, by having the credits roll over the scene and having the theme song still playing, a sense of security is being signaled to the audience instead. Basically, they know nothing's gonna happen because the credits are still rolling. Thankfully, a blank copy of the shot was kept around for when they needed to translate credits, and so they were able to use the unaltered shot in the reconstruction. So next I'll go into the actors for this film. There were a ton of great ones. Several of them were Wells' friends that he just recruited to make small cameos for this film. Most notably would be Marlena Dietrich, who definitely surprised the executives when they were watching the dailies. And they said, is that Marlena Dietrich? And they said, 
Yeah, that's Marlena Dietrich. Do we have a deal with her? No, I don't know. Where'd she come from? I don't know. <laughs> and many Welsh regulars are in this film, too. You've got Ray Collins, Harry Shannon, Gus Schilling, and Joseph Cotton, of course, makes an appearance. And I mean, that's just scratching the surface. There are like 20 other notable names as well, like Dennis Weaver, Joseph Kalea, Valentin de Vargas, way too many to go in depth into. I mean, let alone the three leads, Charlton Heston, Orson Welles, and Janet Leigh. But everyone really does a great job in this. And I found, especially for someone like me who's really into film history and classic films in general, this is also a very interesting film for just all the actor connections that it has. I mean, one kind of coincidence, for example, the actor Mort Mills, who plays a character named Al Schwartz in this, is probably more recognizable as the highway patrol officer who stops Janet Lee in Psycho. And that's not the only Psycho connection with this film, but more on that later. And so you'd think with having all these great actors, and Orson Welles writing, directing, and acting again, and on top of that, this just being a really revolutionary film for the time. you think it would have been a pretty big hit, but sadly that was not the case at all. Much of the initial problem was just that there was not much interest in releasing it. With all the re-editing and added scenes and the Orson Welles memo and all of that drama, the studio seemed pretty done with the film. So after they finished the theatrical cut, they basically just released it as a B-movie, giving it minimal advertising and showing it as the latter half of Double Bills. Needless to say, this did not get the recognition it deserved when it came out, much like a good number of these films I've been talking about. Despite this, the film still managed to be selected for the Brussels World Film Festival in 1958, and Wills actually took home the two top awards. And an interesting thing to note, two of those judges that were at that film festival and happened to give Wells his awards were none other than the French film critics Jean-Luc Godard and Francois Truffaut who the very next year began making their own films, using many of the same techniques that Wells was actually showing off in Touch of Evil. Things like the primarily on-location filming, even recording conversations in real moving cars, as well as the use of handheld cameras. All of these techniques would later become staples of the French New Wave, and as we see here can also be traced back to Touch of Evil. But Truffaut and Godard weren't the only directors at the time who were clearly influenced by this film. I'd say probably the most obvious film that comes to mind is Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho, which came out two years later. I mean, of course, there's the Janet Lee connection and, as I mentioned earlier, Mort Mills. But other than that, there's also a scene in the film where they drop off Janet Lee's character at this motel in the middle of nowhere alone with this very nervous and awkward night manager. Yeah, Janet Lee didn't have much luck at motels back in those days. The night manager is brilliantly played by Dennis Weaver, who at that time was mainly known for playing Chester in Gunsmoke. Later in the 70s, though, he got his own TV show, McLeod, and is also often recognized as the main character in Steven Spielberg's first film, Duel. But here he plays this very jittery guy who just doesn't know what to do when the police drop off Janet Lee at his motel. He's just this guy who's been alone out in the middle of nowhere his whole life and is just really goofy and weird. He adds some unexpected humor to the horrific scene where the grandy thugs break into Janet Lee's room. And overall he just adds a really interesting element to this film. But really, that is kind of where the similarity to Psycho ends. If you've seen that film, you know Norman Bates is a little more subdued and has a much different character arc than our night manager in this film. But still, it's pretty interesting to see such similarities in two films that came out at the same time by two directors who really revolutionized the way that we make movies. Hitchcock reportedly was a pretty big fan of this film, so it makes sense that he would use this as a reference when he was creating a similarly feeling motel in Psycho. 
And another thing to keep in mind, as I said earlier, Touch of Evil was basically considered to be a B-movie, even though it had pretty big name stars in it. It wasn't really thought of as a highbrow movie or anything, and it was made on a pretty low budget. And if you remember the video I did on Psycho last Halloween, I mentioned one of the goals and the reasons for Hitchcock making Psycho was he wanted to take the low budget horror genre and push it to its limits while still using the resources available but using them in a different way, much as he had seen Orson Welles do a few years earlier with Touch of Evil. Well, I guess that just about wraps up all I have to say about this film. It's like no other I've seen, and as I mentioned before, it's had a huge effect on me and the way I make films and watch them. Of course, there is so much else that I could go into with this, so be sure to comment below with any other interesting tidbits you may know that I didn't talk about in this. But before I go into where you can find this film, I want to tell you a bit about what I'm planning for next month. So as you've likely noticed, I haven't been doing the weekly update thing for quite a while. I took a month off or so earlier in the year so I could focus more fully on my short film. And I've had some trouble getting back on that schedule for a number of reasons. But October is a pretty special month for me. I mean, for one, I was born in October, but I am also a pretty big fan of classic horror films. So much like last year, if you remember that, I'm going to try and do one Halloween-themed film a week. And then to top off the month, I'm going to premiere the short film that I've been working on on Halloween. It's going to be a lot of work for sure, but I'm hoping that now that I have publicly committed to it, that I will find a way to make it happen. So there you go, the plan is three new horror film recommendations and then one kind of spooky, funny short film to end the month with. But before I get too far ahead of myself, let me tell you where you can watch this film. So for this one, I'm actually going to recommend that you get this physically. I'd say preferably through purchasing, but uh, maybe you can get it through your library or if you have a video rental store nearby, you can check it out. But basically I'm saying this because you really should check out the reconstructed version. For most of the sites like Amazon and Vudu where you could rent this film digitally, it was only available in the 95 minute theatrical version. Not necessarily the best way to go. I mean it's not completely awful or anything, you can still get a lot out of that, but I definitely recommend checking out the reconstructed version. As I said before, they made a ton of improvements to the film, and it's just a lot smoother and easier to follow. And thankfully, pretty much every physical version, whether it be DVD or Blu-ray, includes the reconstructed film, at least as some kind of bonus feature. And this version I have here is the Blu-ray that Universal put out a few years back, and it's really quite good. It says limited edition on it, but I believe you can find it at most places that would carry classic films like this. I believe the limited aspect of it deals more with the slipcover and the booklet inside, because the Blu-ray itself is pretty standard and still being sold from what I've seen. But the cool thing about this memo though is that it includes the 58th page memo that Orson Welles wrote in a nice little printed booklet. So a really cool added feature to it, but you can find the document itself online pretty easily as like a PDF or whatever. So not too much lost if you can't get a hold of the limited edition version. But that being said, I can definitely recommend picking up the Blu-ray. Not only does it come with some really great interviews and documentaries, but it also includes each of the three versions that are available. And what's really great is each of these different versions of the film have one to two commentary tracks with them as well. And so I found this disc, the bonus features, and the booklet is a great resource not only for studying this film, but also just the effects that editing can have on our perception of characters and story. I never really checked out the commentary tracks before working on this video, but I have to say they did a really good job on them. And each one is pretty different. They keep the overlapping information to a minimum. Everyone had different things to say and different perspectives on the film. So it gives some value to checking them all out. 
But I definitely recommend anyone who's into filmmaking to take a weekend or two and really get into this film and the different versions of it. And also read the memo and listen to Wells' reasonings behind his different choices that he made and what kind of effects that has. And even for those who are just interested in watching the film, I'd still recommend this as it has the reconstructed version. But I guess at the end of the day, regardless of what version you see, it's a great film and it's definitely worth your time. All right, so this week I'm going to be asking you what film or films had the biggest impact on you? As I mentioned before, this was a huge one for me. I remember where I was when I saw it and how stunned I was by it. And I'm wondering if you guys have films that did similar things for you. Be sure to comment them down below and start discussing. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit the like button below and subscribe for new videos coming soon. Remember to keep watching movies and I will see you in October.